What is going on, mere mortals? My name is John Solo, and if you grew up watching Swan Princess, Barbie of Swan Lake, or Black Swan, then I would recommend closing out of this video now, because chances are you're gonna be traumatized by what it contains. Well, if you grew up watching Black Swan, then you're probably already traumatized, so you're fine to stick around, but I stand by what I said for the other two movies. If you have any core memories associated with them that you don't want me to corrupt, you might be better off watching another video of mine. Just a heads up though, pretty much all of my content is childhood ruining in one way or another. Now, while those movies may have taught you that there is such a thing as true love and that dreams do come true, the ballet they were based on, Swan Lake, tells a tale that's quite a bit darker. A tale where the only dreams that come true are nightmares and where evil triumphs over good. That is, depending on the version. Each director likes to add their own artistic influence on the story, and there has been a lot of directors, which means there's been a lot of endings. Some were happy, some weren't. In this episode, we're gonna focus on the original not-so-happy ending. Now, you may have already noticed there's a part one in this episode's title. That's because the origins of the Swan Maiden go deeper than the Swan Lake Ballet. The ballet's storyline is an original work that wasn't based on a single myth or fairy tale, but certain elements of its plot do show up in stories that we've been telling each other since the ancient days. Evil doppelgangers, monstrous animal hybrids, even the Swan Maiden herself. In this episode, we're gonna focus on the ballet story and the many spinoffs it inspired, and in part two, which is coming on January 12th, we'll dive into the folklore and mythology that Pyotr Tchaikovsky borrowed from when he composed the ballet in 1877. Be sure to subscribe and ring that bell so you don't miss part two's premiere, but now it's time to dive into the messed up origins of Swan Lake. So I just want to reiterate that for the sake of my own sanity, we're focusing on three relatively modern adaptations, Barbie of Swan Lake, Swan Princess, and Black Swan. As far as the ballet is concerned, we're going with the original tragic plotline, though we may briefly touch on a few others because I actually watched the wrong performance in preparation for this episode, and I don't want the 140 minutes I spent watching ballet to have been for nothing. Yeah, I counted all the minutes. That's how much fun I was having. So the Swan Lake Ballet begins on a special occasion, Prince Siegfried's 21st birthday. The man of the hour is having a blast twirling around with his party guests, but his mother ruins the fun when she tells the no longer young royal that he needs to settle down and find a woman to spend the rest of his life with. The prince doesn't want to do that though. Right now, he's the equivalent of Pinocchio at Pleasure Island. He isn't ready to become a real boy and shoulder the responsibility that comes with. So, like the puppet he is, he runs away from his problems and takes the crossbow his mother gave him as a birthday present into the woods to blow off some steam. Right away, there are a ton of similarities with the Swan Princess movie, although the setup is very different. In the Swan Princess, the story opens by introducing the audience to the prince, whose name has been changed to Derek, terrible choice, and Princess Odette. Derek's mother and Odette's father arrange for the two to be married when they come of age, but Derek mucks everything up when he can't name a single thing he likes about Odette besides her hot bod. Like I said, very different setup, but the message portrayed is the same. Derek has some growing up to do. I've been saying that for years, by the way. Derek is the worst. The prince's story in the Barbie movie also has a similar theme, but he's named Daniel and doesn't come across as quite so immature. He just wants to live a little more and go on an adventure or two before settling down and having kids. But his mom is weirdly fixated on him giving her grandbabies. Black Swan is where the similarities get really interesting though. It's definitely not a direct adaptation of the Swan Lake story, but I would argue that the main character Nina's internal struggle with stepping up to be the new lead resembles the prince's conundrum. She's the perfect white swan, but in order to play the black swan, she had to tap into a darker, more chaotic part of her psyche that she wasn't prepared to handle, probably because of how she was coddled her whole life. At the start of the ballet's second act, the prince finds himself alone at a lake deep in the forest, and he spots an astonishingly beautiful swan miraculously turn into a pretty young thing named Odette. She tells the prince about the evil sorcerer, Baron von Rothbart, who's cursed her and about 40 other broads to become swans during the day, and only at night, by the side of the enchanted lake created from the tears of Odette's mother, do they return to human form. She also tells him the only way the spell can be broken is if a 
man who has never loved before vows his undying love to her. The prince, who's clearly thinking with his little prince, is ready to make a vow right then and there but the evil Von Rothbart interrupts this love fest and takes her away. Now I've gotta say that Von Rothbart in the ballet is a confusing villain and a pretty lame one. He turns all of these women into swans, but we never find out what his motivation for doing that is. And you'd think there'd have to be one because that's a really specific curse. This is where the adaptations compensate for the original's minimal narrative. Both the Barbie version and the Swan Princess give him a backstory and an ultimate goal. In the Barbie movie, Rothbart is pissed about not being chosen as the forest's next king and is determined to take it over by force. This is my forest. Mine, just as it always should have been. When Odette finds the magic crystal and becomes the chosen one to defeat Rothbart, he turns her into a swan, because apparently turning his enemies into woodland creatures is sort of his thing. In Swan Princess, Rothbart is mad that he got busted trying to usurp the throne and wants revenge on Odette's father for exiling him. So he ambushes their caravan in the form of a monster called the Great Animal and takes Odette to Swan Lake, where he curses her out of frustration that she won't accept his marriage proposal and make him the new king. Both plans are pretty straightforward and make sense if you don't think about them too hard, but the original Rothbart's plan can't even hold its own against surface level scrutiny. It makes even less sense when you watch the original ending but we'll get to that. Another story element that the adaptations find creative ways to incorporate is the prince's crossbow. Both change it to a bow and arrow, and in both versions, he almost kills Odette with it. In The Swan Princess, he only misses because the puffin pushed her out of the arrow's path. But in Barbie, the prince lowers his bow because he's awestruck by the swan's beauty. And with stunning animation like that, who wouldn't be? Well, just like in the ballet, this close call leads to the princes discovering the swan maiden, learning all about Rothbart's evil deeds, as well as the cure for their curse, a pledge of true love. Only in the swan princess, the pledge has the added requirement of being proven to the world. Otherwise, he could just pledge it right then and there, and the movie would be over. You must make a vow of everlasting love. I make it. Life never makes it easy though, and there are still plenty of obstacles that these lovebirds are gonna have to overcome. Well, I guess it's just one lovebird, the swan. Before we get into act three though, we wanna tell you all about today's sponsor, Extra. Having a good credit score is necessary if you wanna make any important purchase. Could be a cell phone, an engagement ring, or a house but not everyone wants a credit card or can even get one. That's where Extra comes in. Extra is the first debit card ever that builds your credit, and it's a lot simpler than you would expect. Extra uses the Plaid network to connect to your existing bank account and then gives you a spending limit based on the available cash in your account, not your credit score. Once that's set up, you just use the Extra card to make your usual everyday purchases. Extra spots you for those purchases, then pays themselves back the next business day. At the end of the month, all the payments are tallied up and reported to credit bureaus Experian and Equifax as creditworthy payments. And just like that, credit is built. Signing up is also a super easy process. There are no credit checks, no interest, it doesn't require a deposit, and there are no hidden fees. So to those of you who want to start building back your credit, just sign up with the link in my description. That's extra.app slash solo. Extra is a technology company. The Extra debit card is issued by Evolve Bank and Trust, member FDIC, pursuant to a license from MasterCard USA. Extra reports on time and late payments may negatively impact your credit score. Please refer to extra.app slash policies for additional details. The ballet's third act begins one day after Siegfried meets the princess. His mom is hosting another grand celebration where she invited all of the eligible princesses so he can choose one to marry. But Derek's heart is set on Odette and he refuses. That is until Odette herself walks into the gathering. The prince twirls around with her for what feels like 50 years, then declares his love for her. But that is when the truth is revealed. The woman he thought was Odette was really Rothbart's daughter, Odile, in disguise. The prince had pledged himself to the wrong woman, and because he was apparently Odette's last hope at finding a lover, she and her friends would be cursed to stay in their swan forms forever, or until a hunter takes them out. Both of the animated adaptations have their own versions of this ballroom scene. 
In the Barbie version, Odile wears a magic necklace that causes the prince to see her as Odette. And when he says he loves her, the real Odette faints and her magic crystal loses its power, allowing Rothbart to steal it. In Swan Princess, Rothbart doesn't have a daughter. Instead, a weird old lady is his sidekick. Her name is Bridget. I guess, and Rothbart disguises her as Odette, and the prince mistakenly vows to love her, resulting in Odette's apparent death. Full disclosure, I don't totally understand why Prince Siegfried, Derek, or Daniel vowing to love the false Odette would have any impact on the real one. He thinks that she is the real one. It's not like he said the wrong name. He didn't say, take thee, Rachel. I mean, technically in the ballet, he didn't say anything because ballets don't have dialogue, but in The Swan Princess, he specifically names Odette, a fact that he calls out later. The vow I made was for her! need to shout. I feel like the writers put that in there as their way of saying, we know this technically doesn't make sense. Just roll with it. The ballet's fourth act is also its grand finale and where the duel of the fates takes place. Odette's fate, that is. Siegfried is able to reach her in time to explain the mix-up at the ball and Odette forgives him, but the damage has already been done. She's cursed to remain a swan forever except here's the deal kids, she really doesn't want to do that. Refusing to accept this miserable fate, she takes her destiny into her own talons, yeets herself off a cliff, and instead of flapping her wings, she allows herself to plummet into the water and rocks below. Then Siegfried jumps in too, because he's a copycat, and he also dies. Just imagine if the animated version you watched as a kid had this ending. How different would your childhood have been? No, I'm sorry to say that the prince and princess do not get their happily ever after here on the mortal plane, but evidently Siegfried's act of true love was so powerful that it broke Rothbart's curse. The 40-something other women he transfigured were turned human again, and the broken curse causes him to die. I guess. Again, I don't really get what's happening here. I'm assuming his life force was somehow connected to how many swan babes he could make. Oh, and look, Odette and Siegfried are dancing together in the heavens. That's kind of nice. So that was the ballet's original ending, but there have been many more since the OG Pyotr Tchaikovsky composition premiered in Moscow in 1877. One variant that was choreographed in 1969 ends with a duel between the prince and the sorcerer where Siegfried rips off Rothbart's wing which kills him and frees the cursed maidens. The version I mistakenly watched took an even artsier approach. Parts of the story only took place in the prince's dream, including his encounters with Odette. When he realizes this truth, he loses his mind and apparently dies of a broken heart or from Palpatine draining his life force. I couldn't really tell what was going on there without any dialogue, so that's my assumption. That ending in particular reminds me of the ending of Black Swan, which I really don't want to spoil the details of, but simply put, the protagonist Nina is mentally broken just like this prince was. Now I've got to say that I'm pretty impressed with how the Swan Princess and Barbie were able to incorporate both the sad and happy endings into their conclusions. In the Swan Princess, Rothbart and Derek have a pretty epic fight where Rothbart takes on his secondary form as the great animal, a wolf, bat, eagle, lizard hybrid. This great animal was inspired by Rothbart's appearance in the ballet, which usually resembles an owl-type creature, except when he's a demon, of course. In Barbie, they chose to make him and his daughter ugly vulture-looking things. Back to Swan Princess, in one of the smoothest finishing moves in animated history, Derek's friend, Bromley, who's known as Benno in the ballet, shoots an arrow at him. Then Derek snatches the arrow out of the air and reroutes it directly into Rothbart's heart, killing the sorcerer and breaking his curse forever. This allows Odette to come back to life in her beautiful human form, and she and Derek get married, even though nothing has really changed since his original proposal at the start of the movie. I mean, yeah, he saved her life and that definitely counts for something, but if she asked him another time what he likes about her besides her looks, what would he say? I like that you're not a swan anymore. He's learned exactly zero new things about her from this adventure. I digress. I don't want to hate on the cherished happy ending from your childhood. 
even if it is built on lies. I can't believe I'm saying this, but the ending of the Barbie adaptation makes slightly more sense. Admittedly, Odette wakes up from what was supposed to be her death for seemingly no reason at all, but I'll give this a pass because the prince's vow of love was really for her, even if he directed it towards the wrong woman, meaning she really shouldn't have been hurt in the first place. But when Rothbart sends a powerful blast of evil magic towards the couple, both Odette and the prince try to protect each other from it. And as a result, they're both hit by it. Initially, Rothbart thinks that he's finally succeeded in taking over the forest, but this act of true love not only saved their lives, it gave the crystal its power back, and Rothbart is consumed by its magic. Like I said, slightly more sense. I still think it's a stretch, but no more than the original ballet was. Well, after Rothbart's defeat, Odette and Daniel go on to have a lovely wedding ceremony in the Enchanted Forest. Meanwhile, Rothbart's daughter is stuck working as a maid. Oh, and Rothbard himself was turned into a cuckoo clock. A fitting ending for a guy who liked to transform people into animals, I must say. So those are just a few of the many stories Swan Lake has inspired since it first debuted about 150 years ago. Now the question remains, what stories inspired Swan Lake? That's what we'll be discussing in part two, which you can expect in January. I would have loved to give you the whole spiel in a single episode, but splitting it into two parts means I can give you all the juicy details instead of glossing over the good stuff for the sake of time. So mark January 12th on your calendars and be sure to subscribe because you don't want to miss what's coming next week either. Our biggest, priciest episode of Featured Folklore is in the final stages of development, and I cannot wait for you to see what we've been working on since August. Neither can our shining star, Hephaestus. I just love the design for this guy. He's so ugly cute, kind of like Gunther. Are you ugly cute like Hephaestus? Thank you all for tuning in to this episode of Messed Up Origins, the final Messed Up Origins of 2022. It's been an absolute roller coaster of a year, and you and I have a lot to catch up on, but we'll wait until the New Year's update for that conversation. In the meantime, I hope you have a lovely holiday season, that 2023 is your best year yet, and that you tune into Featured Folklore next week. It's going to be really good, okay? That's all I'm saying. I'll see you mere mortal soon. My name is John Solo, and remember... John shot first.